Uh, welcome, I'm Paula Neme, I'm part of the EHF team, and it's great to have you here. This is our first session, uh, first workshop of the New Frontiers Digital that we are doing, and this is an offering that we are having for the community, a way for the EHF fellows to get to know different people and, and in, in the community around the world, and for all of you to get to know the fellows. And I'm super excited that we're excited with Bo starting with Boyd. Uh, apart that he's amazing and he moved here not long ago. Uh, his story is really, really cool to hear. So before handing out to you, Boyd, I just wanna say a few housekeeping. Uh, if you are not uh, talking, please mute yourself. If you see in your own face, like in your um, window, there is three dots and you can rename yourself. Uh, if you can add your location, I think that's a really cool thing to know from which part of the world you are joining us. Today, most of us are in Wellington, like the speakers and the, and the host, and me and Michelle. But uh, I know there's people coming from different parts of the world, and we would love to know uh, from where you are joining us. Um, as I said before, uh, we'll, this session is being recorded, and then we will share this, the recording with you afterwards and for you to share it. Uh, with whoever you think will need. Maybe some people will be joining in mid-meeting, uh, so we just let them in and unmute themselves. Uh, and now, Boyd, I will go with you. Thank you, Paula. Hi, I'm Boyd. And uh, let's see, I joined the EHF, um, gosh, about a year and a half ago. Um, well, at least that's when it officially began. The story begins a bit before that. Um, let's roll back a couple of years. I had spent a long time at Microsoft and was uh, kind of burned out and really tired and uh, wanted to do a new project. So after we left, uh, the family and I were trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And one of the exercises that we ran was, um, you know, sometimes you end up in a position in life where you get to pick where you want to build something and where you want to be instead of joining something that already existed. So we set about doing this exercise where um, she had been studying data science and built a model. We had this long conversation about what are the values that we have in a place we would choose to live and it included things like good schools and healthcare and stable government, stable currency, uh, good business law, weather, traffic patterns, uh, you, know, you, you end up sitting down and you write a list of the things that you care about. It ends up being longer than you expect. Uh, probably about 60 criteria that we listed out. And then, um, you know, just trying to be open-minded about where we're going to go. So we started listing uh, countries and cities that we would be interested in. And I'd say 20 or 30 cities in the U.S. and then pick places all around the world. Um, I don't think we actually knew that much about New Zealand at this time. So Auckland was pretty easy to put in the list. And then what the heck, let's put the capital in. That's Wellington, never heard of it. Um, Australia, Norway, Spain, Finland, all kinds of places were in there. Uh, and then you go about collecting as good and neutral data as you possibly can. Uh, so we found several sources that had rankings of different metrics about all these different cities. So at least you know that those metrics are normalized against each other, put it all in. And we were really surprised the first time we ran the model because Wellington popped out as the number one city in the world for our set of criteria. I'm like, oh, okay, didn't really know anything about the place. And you start dialing knobs and you're changing things in the model. Uh, hey, I'm gonna change a waiting factor on traffic. You could see Wellington would drop a couple spots and maybe Auckland would come up. Slightly better weather, definitely worse traffic. Uh, but New Zealand had uh, several cities that stayed in the top five pretty much no matter what we did. Um, if, you, uh, if, you dropped, if you dropped temperature down, you could see Stockholm start coming up, but you know, it gets kind of cold there. Um, so that was, that, was an interesting, that was an interesting experience. And then like a week later, um, I saw this thing called Look See Wellington go by in an in a article in some newspaper. This is several years ago. And okay, wonder what this is. And they were trying to bring tech people into Wellington. So I uh, ended up finding myself part of that experience and ended up becoming a week in Wellington to just check the place out. And you look at it around and A, it's gorgeous. This is a really pretty city. Um, a little on the windy side, not as hot as other parts of the country, but 
absolutely gorgeous. And uh, there's a saying that people here say, which is you can't beat Wellington on a good day, which I totally believe. Um, anyway, by the end of the week, um, I was pretty convinced this is a good place to start a business. It's a good place to get work done. It's, got, it's a good place to have schools. It's a gorgeous place to live. It's, it's um, how to put it, it's got culture like it's a big city. But size-wise, it isn't that big. It's about a half a million people, but it's compressed in the middle. And you end up with a very dense inner part of the city with lots of restaurants and art and all kinds of things to do. So it feels like it's got the culture of a much larger city. You know, and I'm coming from Seattle. So uh, to me, the, the cultural aspects of a Seattle and Wellington are pretty similar, even though Seattle is many times the size. Okay, so after that week, it was interesting. I'm talking to people from immigration and talking to people from Wellington and the week ended and it's sort of a typical learning. This is a typical New Zealand sort of attitude. They're like, okay, well, this is great. We'd love to have you here to start a business, but we don't have any visas for you. We'll figure it out later. So it went home, kind of went on with my, with my life and building stuff. And about six months later, I got a phone call from the city saying, hey, uh, go check out the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, which turned out to be a really good connection. So uh, that began the next bit of learning about, about New Zealand and about places to be and you know, continuing in our, our journey of what do we want to do. And uh, if you're going to move and you're moving to a new place and there's not a lot of people that you know, like my networks of people that I'm super close with are back in Seattle or Atlanta, right, Leonard? I see Leonard there, he's giving me a thumbs up. Um, there's lots of people that I've worked with in the past that are back in the States, but if you're going to pick up and move to a new location, one of the things you have to worry about is how do you rebuild your network and rebuild it quickly? Um, so the, the fellowship became a, um, an avenue for that to happen. A way you can come in and you can land, you can meet a rather diverse set of people, and some of whom are going to be a lot like you and some of whom aren't, and that's a good thing and a bad thing all wrapped up in one. Um, but then you know you go through a fairly long a fairly long application process lots of interviews and you get in and we had a we had this moment this is going to be what about about two years ago uh when we got the confirmation that we were in and that we had this choice now are we actually going to go through with this are we actually going to move to new zealand i mean in the fellowship for sure but do you actually pick your family up and move because it's kind of a big deal so we had this uh, family meeting one night and, um, and my wife and I had already talked about it and we went to each of the kids and said, okay, we have this opportunity to move to New Zealand. It's gonna be a lot of things that are different. There's gonna be a lot of things that are the same, but either way, it's a big, it's a big change. And, and we wanted to know from each of them, uh, what was their opinion? And our oldest immediately said, yeah, I'm in 100%. And then the middle one, I think she was quiet for a little while and then she started crying and she was worried about missing her friends. And then the youngest one said, when you guys get in the airplane, that's when I'll say goodbye. <laughs> okay, so uh, roll forward a little bit in time. We've come here, it is uprooting your family. It is uprooting your network. Um, it is good to land in a place where you can rebuild your networks, but it turns out New Zealand is a really cosmopolitan place. And, I can't really speak to some of the other cities, but Wellington is especially so. So immediately we started making friends from all over the world. The kids have all got new friends. They're all happy. The youngest one actually settled in the fastest. She's got her new friend group immediately. Um, you know, and then as you get older, it gets harder as you know, typical teenage stuff. Um, so now we're here and busy building a business. And I'll give a couple observations about New Zealand overall. One, if, you're, if, I'm, if I was building a business where I was going to be shipping goods all over the world, I'm not sure this is the right place, right? This is not a geographically located kind of place where you want to put stuff in containers and ship it all over. You're kind of far from everywhere. Now, if you're building things that get built in other manufacturing centers that have really good, that have really good containers and really good shipping, different story, right? But you don't come here to ship from it. You, this is a great place to build software. This is a great place to build intellectual property. This is a great place to do fundamental research. 
It's a great place to build products that ship digitally. Um, and whether that's movies or interesting deep tech software or IP or whatever, that's all super easy because the internet's great. Um, pretty soon we'll have satellite connections everywhere and uh, that's just not a barrier. Let's see, so let me look at my notes. Um, another interesting thing about landing here is that you quickly realize, or at least I quickly realized, that each of the major cities has got an economic development agency. And here in Wellington is called RETA, uh, W-R-E-D-A, Wellington Regional Economic Development Agency. And it's not something I was really used to in the States. Um, and like in Seattle, yeah, there's various boards and there's like Chamber of Commerce and there's different things that kind of help businesses get going, but you're a little bit more on your own. Here, RETA is actively looking out for the economic interests of the whole region. And they ended up being a resource that I found to be really interesting. I still get calls from people in Christchurch who uh, let me know how great Christchurch is as a city. And, you know, every once in a while I get the pitches. So maybe you should move your business down to Christchurch instead of in Wellington. Uh, at which point I remind them, I've been, to, I've been to Christchurch twice and both days it rained. So according to my data, it rains 100% of the time there. And I can see some of the New Zealand people are like smiling at that because it's completely not true. The weather is much nicer in Christchurch, but not according to my data. So let's see, uh, I'm going to switch over and share a screen for a second here. Uh, let's get the right one. Okay, um, what you're looking at is a map of New Zealand. And uh, can, you see, can you see it correctly? Uh, Paul and Nod, if you can see it. Okay, so you're looking at a map of New Zealand. And right in the middle, right here, uh, I shouldn't have moved it. Right here in the middle where the little red star is, that's where Wellington is. Uh, it's kind of in the center, it's at the bottom end of the South Island. Temperature wise up here in the uh, in Northland, way up here is quite hot. Every time I go to Auckland, I think it's a nice place. It's too hot for me uh, and lots of traffic. Uh, Hamilton is very rural, lots of cows, lots of farming. Uh, Rotorua is very nice, especially if you like the smell of sulfur. Um, let's see, Lake Taupo is up in the mountains. It's basically a big crater lake. Wellington is down at the bottom. It's super interesting. This is the seat of government. This is where the, uh, the parliament is. This is where the center of all that sort of action is. It's also got a really big software community and a big research community. And that's very interesting. Down in Christchurch, I'm going to say there seems to be a lot of aerospace down there. Um, after the big earthquake in what, 2011, uh, they've been rebuilding that city and they've broken it into different districts. There's a tech focused district and an education district and a health district. And that's uh, it, it, very interesting from a planned perspective. I've never been down to Dunedin. Um, it's on my list. Queenstown is, of course, completely gorgeous. It's up in the mountains. And if you've ever been to Whistler in Canada, it's like that, except prettier. All right, now, uh, it's one thing to talk about places. This is a official picture of Wellington. You can see it's in the bay. I it's can't, the slide didn't move. Oh, the slide didn't I move? Still, I still see the map. Oh, you still see the map, okay. Yeah. Um, let me... Oh, my screen sharing is paused. Resume. Now, uh, Do you want to okay. see the picture? Yes. Okay. All right, so here we have an official picture of Wellington. And you can see it's got a nice bay, it's got lots of waterfront, it's a really pretty city. But whenever I see official pictures like this, I ask myself, okay, so what is it really like when you're not from the exact right perfect location and it's not the exact right perfect day? So about, I'm looking at the time. About half an hour ago, I walked out onto the front porch and held my phone up and took that picture. Uh, so Wellington's an interesting place. Um, it, if you've ever been to Hawaii, it looks like, it's like, I call it cold Honolulu, right? So it's got a bay and the city is compressed into that bay and behind it are lots of hills and lots of verticality with lots of, lots of vegetation. And the people live up in the hills. So almost anywhere you go, uh, you're either uh, you know, somewhere on a hill, maybe you're at the bottom of a valley or at the top, but you end up with lots of views like this. Here we are looking away from the water. So this, is, this would be like a typical Wellington territorial view. 
and it's hard to not get a view because the houses are literally like you go one house next to each other, it's going to be, you know, 40 feet higher in the air and you're going to get tons of tons of views. It's just that kind of place. It's kind of weird to drive around because some of the roads are really compressed and it has to curve around the hills and you think what insane person put a city here. Um, but it sure makes for interesting driving and it's a gorgeous place. Um, <clears throat> a couple days ago, I walked a couple blocks down the road and um, this is, I was walking the dogs which is weird because there's no cars and everyone's still in lockdown. Uh, and I took the city looking out from the cable car out over the, out over the, over the city. And this is just a gorgeous place. I can't emphasize that enough. And lots of scenes like this, lots of public parks out in the beaches. Uh, this one's obviously not a beach, but there's good beaches too. Like this one where my daughter does a lot of, uh, my oldest daughter does a lot of rowing and a huge into sport here. And if you don't have a sport that you're into, there's probably one you've never heard of that they're into. Uh, it doesn't have to be rugby or any of those things, which uh, I would personally, not for me, but you know, rowing, yeah, interesting. Just, they're very into this kind of stuff. Okay, um, other things I've learned about about New Zealand, there's a lot of support from government and from other things that frankly, I'm just not used to. Uh, I'm still working at uh, building up my connections with a group called Callahan, but it's a national research organization that is there to support businesses doing research. Um, and includes things like uh, grants to help you get your get research done here. Uh, they've got labs, they've got equipment uh, and those, you know, so there's a piece of equipment that I need for one of the things I'm researching. There's no way I could ever afford it. Um, and even if I bought a really old used one, it would fill the, uh, well, <laughs> it would fill a couple of rooms in the house. So I'm not getting one of these things. My wife said no. Um, but Callahan's got them and they've got the right room set up and they've got people who know how to use these things. It's a, it's a vacuum chamber vapor, vapor deposition machine doesn't matter. Uh, they've got one, they've got it set up, you can totally work with them to get these things used. Um, so the point is, there's a lot of support and, um, and, and agencies and, and people who are available to help with things that I, I, I just wasn't used to having these kinds of things available back in other places. Why don't we take a couple of questions and then I will probably babble on a little bit more as I, um, as I remind myself of things I wanted to talk about that I forgot. So Paula or Michelle, why don't you, why don't you cue me up with something? Yes. Um, I have a, a person ask, uh, does the flight connection via Auckland bother you when traveling internationally for work? Ah. Okay, so does the flight connection through Auckland bother me when traveling internationally? Uh, no, I'm gonna say no. It's a super short flight to Auckland. Um, it's like, slightly less than an hour. So you, it's, like, it's like you're commuting up to Auckland, then you have to walk 10 minutes to the other terminal, and then it's the flight out of Auckland that bothers me, right? Because you can't get anywhere internationally without sitting on a plane for a minimum of four hours. Just going to Australia is a four hour flight. So I'm not gonna pretend that it's, got, that it's great from a connections point of view, you're just far away from everything. Right. Now, within New Zealand, flying within the country is super easy. Um, I, I personally like Air New Zealand, and there's flights to everywhere, and they're pretty frequent. And uh, I don't know how to put it, um, strangest experience when I first got here. And so we land, we're going through our stuff, we go through our EHF Welcome Week, and then uh, the city of Christchurch had hosted a bunch of the incoming fellows. So this is my first internal flight. Right, so we've landed, we rented a car, we drove down to Wellington. So I'm about to get on my first flight and we're running late. This is one of those days when Wellington traffic actually bit us because the tunnel, Victoria Tunnel was kind, of, was kind of slow. So I'm running short on time. I have to get to the airport and I have to get my flight to Christchurch and I'm starting to really stress out. It's like the flight's in an hour. And in any airport in the States, you know, you're, you're, you're done. It's not gonna work if you, if you get there uh, too close to your actual flight. So I get to Wellington, I get to the airport, I'm running through the airport, I've got my ticket, I'm looking for my flight, it says, okay, it's coming out of gate 19. Um, and I'm like racing, trying to find, trying to find where security to get into it. Okay, I'm at gate 19, I show my ticket, they're like, okay, I run through the thing, uh, I'm on the airplane. 
strangest experience. I was so not expecting it for really local flights when you're not on a jet. It was a prop plane. There just wasn't any security. It's like hopping on a bus. Right? Because people were they're trusting here. And it's a small community. You're far away from things. It's a different mindset. And I just about fell over that day. Even today, uh, like when I fly to Auckland, that's on a jet. So you do have to go through security with a metal detector and all that stuff. And I'm standing in line. I'm trying to chug my coffee before I get to the metal detector. And the guy's like, just carry it through. OK. Oh, I see. I can just carry my coffee through. Right? So it's slightly lower key. Getting around internally is tremendously easier on the airways than I was expecting. The roads are good, so you can drive everywhere. But you know, driving Wellington to Auckland is going to be about eight hours. So, but easy flights to get around. Uh, and then when you do the international hop, if you're going to Australia, you can go uh, Australia and Singapore. You can go directly international out of Wellington. But that little hop up to Auckland is a piece of cake. Cool. So, Boyd, we have a question from uh, uh, there from Ramesh. You started the new businesses before or after you landed in Wellington? Did I start the new business before or after? Um, both. So the main one I'm pushing, I had started back in the States and had already been working on for a year or two. And it's now getting re-formalized uh, here in New Zealand as a New Zealand company, but it's an effort that I've been working on for a while. I've got another one, which um, is more of a research sort of project, and I'm doing that largely in conjunction with Victoria University, and that's been built here. Uh, so that one's been uh, formed here and started from scratch. Um, starting a company here is tremendously easier than anything I've experienced before. Uh, in the States, um, when I formed companies there, it usually takes a bunch of work with lawyers and quite a bit of money and a lot of effort to, uh, to get yourself set up. Uh, but you end up with, uh, you know, you end up with a company. Here, it took about an hour on a government website and I was in. So that was, uh, that was a different experience. Now, I don't know exactly where you wanted to go with that question. So if you have more detail on it, uh, pass along. Or ask another question. I, yeah, I have another question. Um, yeah. What are the three things about your move to New Zealand or Wellington uh, that you know that would have saved you some time, stress, money, if you would have known before? Sure. Um, let's start with schools. Uh, the New Zealand school system is, um, at first glance, it seems a little bit old fashioned, right? So the schools are generally segregated, uh, boys and girls. They generally wear uniforms. And they're generally really good, and we could have just not stressed so much about it. Um, so we ended up going through a ton of research and talking to a ton of schools. And now a uh, year and a half in, uh, we realized, no, all the schools here are actually pretty good. And it's, it's hard to go too wrong with it. The separating the boys and the girls, that takes a little bit of getting used to. Everyone's wearing uniforms. That definitely took a little bit to get used to. But once you're there, it's actually, it's pretty easy. The second thing, um, let's see, second thing that would have saved me time and money. Ah, yeah. Um, I didn't understand what the ACC was. All right. It, I don't even know what it fully stands for. I think it's accident. Accident compensation. Um, uh, ooh. Yeah. I forgot what the other C is. Yeah. yeah. But so it's, two, corporation. It's yeah. Okay. Corporation. Yep. Okay, so the ACC is, a, is, is different from what you see, especially in the States. Um, it is a accident insurance program that covers everybody in the country, right? So in the US, you actually worry a little bit about inviting friends over to your house because if they slip and fall on your stairs, you might get sued. Okay, nobody has trampolines in the US because if the neighbor kids come onto the trampoline and someone gets hurt, you're going to get sued. Right. That stuff is just not a thing here because the AC, what they've done is it's not just a national accident coverage scheme. It's also uh, major changes to tort law. You, if you, let's say your kid is over at a friend's house and they're on the trampoline and someone gets hurt, A, the ACC is going is is to cover it and 
get that person whatever care they need. And B, you're not allowed to sue them. It's just not the same kind of tort law. Right, so that would have saved me a fair amount of just general paranoia in the beginning and um, worrying I was somehow doing this wrong because I couldn't figure out, well, what are you liable for here? And what are you gonna get sued for? And what sort of accident coverage do you need without realizing that they've kind of got that taken care of already, mm. right? Uh, the next one was probably a US centric thing in that, of course, I'm worried about healthcare because um, it's incredibly expensive and private insurance focused. And um, I'm just not gonna go, I, I can complain about the US healthcare system, but that's not the point. Um, healthcare here is really pretty easy. Um, you don't have to have insurance uh, because there's general coverage, but if you do, it was really easy to obtain and really inexpensive, at least coming from a US perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, third, I mean, we could go into things like words, right? There's just a bunch of uh, tips that I've been collecting for people who are coming to New Zealand. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to give them all. <laughs> um, uh, this, this goes everything from, look, you're driving on the left. Don't go on the right. There's certain intersections that really look like you want to go on the right. Don't do it. Um, let's see, that, that tip is if you're on Highway 1, I want to pause here for a second. In New Zealand, in my mind, there really is only one highway, and it's Highway 1. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the kind of highway that in the U.S., we, you know, you would call it a freeway where you have to go on, on and off ramps, except at, uh, anytime you go through a town, there's stop signs and lights, and it's not the freeway in the same sense that you would have there. Uh, so there's this intersection on Highway 1 where you're taking the exit to Kelburn and it comes off onto the terrace and you're on the right. And uh, boy, it feels like you want to turn into the right lane on the right side. Don't do it. Other than that, uh, things to know, uh, crosswalks are super serious. If someone's even about to put a toe into the crosswalk, you stop. Uh, there is no right on red, especially true for Americans and Canadians. You're used to taking a right on red. It would be, I guess, left on red here. Don't do it. No one's expecting it. It's not allowed. Um, there's a ton of other ones. And as we talk, I'm sure we'll queue them up. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, another question that's come in is, how do you compare the cost of living between Seattle and Wellington? That's a good question. Cost of living between Seattle and Wellington. Um, it's weird. I'm going to say, um, Lots of people here like to complain about the cost of housing. It's less expensive, right? Cost of housing here is less expensive than the equivalent housing in Seattle. Even though when you talk to the Kiwis, they're all gonna complain about how much the price has gone up, it's still less expensive than the cost of living in Seattle. Food is about the same. Uh, food in New Zealand is set by international transfer pricing. Right? So it's a competitive global market. New Zealand is a food producing country, but they export almost all of it, which means that the prices of it are set on world markets. So milk, cheese, produce, everything is about the same as what we paid in Seattle. Housing's cheaper, food's the same, education is uh, a half to a third the price. So um, I've researched private schools in Seattle. We've got our kids in a private school here. I, I, we got three of them in a private school for the price we would have paid to have one in private school in Seattle. Uh, let's see, cars. Uh, cars are actually kind of expensive and gas is kind of expensive, but the insurance is not, right? Um, but then again, uh, especially in a city like Wellington, you don't drive that much, right? Wellington is really easy to walk across. It's got great transportation. It's got good air connections. Um, we pretty much use the car to go to the grocery, so we're spending way less on that. What other types of, uh, let's see, airfare, similar to what you'd see in, in the States. I think that's set by fuel prices. Yeah, so I'm gonna say similar to Seattle on many things except housing where it's actually less expensive. And don't ask me about buying a house because I'm not allowed to yet. <laughs> Sure. So by renting, you can tell that it's similar, cheaper. Well, 
here. Yeah, I mean, you know, we dream about it and we think forward. And when you look at house prices, I'm going to say they're significantly less expensive than buying a house in Seattle. But we haven't actually gone through that yet. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I have another question. Yeah. Um, how are you benefiting from the EHF network of fellows, investors, and experts? And how are you planning to scale up your business with their help? Well, the best part about, I mean, the best part about the EHF network is when you land, you don't know anybody. Right? When you're coming here, you don't have a network. You don't know who you're going to, you don't know who you're going to end up working with. Uh, and, you, and you need to build that network up quickly. And that's something I was super worried about. And uh, that w the single best thing out of the EHF network was rebuilding a new one very quickly. So the business partner I'm founding it with, I met him at an EHF event. Um, a local guy, he came to New Frontiers and uh, we headed off and okay, I found my business partner like way sooner than I thought I would. Um, when it comes to the other fellows, I'll say that mostly they're doing their own independent work. So it's, it's more like we advise each other. I see Leonard sitting here sort of like this. And you know, I'm hoping to get your advice, Leonard. Um, that's gonna happen when he eventually moves out here once the lockdown is down, once the lockdown is over. And I, uh, I assume that uh, travel plans are all messed up at the moment. No, we should talk about lockdown, don't let me forget, because this has been a very interesting experience. But when it comes to working with the other fellows, it's so far it's been less working with them, more advising each other, telling each other stories that help save time and money later on. Um, the best connections I've gotten through the HF are actually to uh, the, some of the local Maori leaders, some of the local business leaders. Uh, that's been super useful. Um, has been I haven't been personally interested in getting investment money, so I can't really speak to that angle on it. Yeah, Michelle. Um, another question here. Why did you decide to put your kids in private school if public schools are pretty much the same quality? Okay. That's a good question. Um, and I, I'll give you two answers. First one's the, probably the real one is, is a little bit cheesy. Um, we didn't know where we wanted to live. And when you're moving your family across the, across the world and you're uprooting them, uh, that is a big, it's a big hit to your kids. So we wanted to put them in a school um, where if we chose the wrong neighborhood, we chose the wrong part of town, we wouldn't be forced to move them again. Right, so there are catchments and depending on what part of the city you live in, that's the set of public schools you're gonna go to. And if you pick the wrong one and you move, you're gonna switch. All right, so we wanted to be able to have a little bit of freedom Secondly, you know, I don't know that they're exactly the same quality. They're all very good. There were certain programs at the school that we chose which really appealed to our kids. And that is, was a big factor in why we chose those schools. Like Wellington Girls is a very, very good school, but you know, the classrooms are gonna be about double the number of kids for a teacher. And uh, they've actually got slightly more options than Queen Margaret, which is where two of our kids are at. But at Queen Margaret, much smaller, uh, student to teacher ratios, uh, very, very good scores on the tests, that kind of thing. Um, another angle on it was, we're the ones making a choice to move across the ocean. We're the ones choosing to move our kids out of the US and go to a school somewhere else. I wanted them to be in a school that had an international baccalaureate program, which is recognized by universities all over the world. The public schools are good, they're NCEA, uh, it's a New Zealand set of standards, but it's not necessarily the international standard. So I did, we personally didn't want our choice to move to New Zealand to impact the options our kids had uh, when they leave school. So it, uh, we decided it had to be a school that had an IB program. And those are the private schools. Thank you. Okay. Um, Shall we talk little... about lockdown for a minute? Yes, I, I, I was going to say that. So you talked about lockdown and we have maybe a few minutes as well for other questions. If someone has any, please post them in the chat window. Yeah, let's just, let's just, let's just spend a couple of minutes on, on coronavirus and the lockdown. Um, I'm wildly blown away and impressed with New Zealand's reaction to it. Um, it may have been a little bit of time in coming in that we were reading news about 
the virus and, and situations around the world. But boy, when they decided to do something, they sure the heck did it. So the whole country has been in lockdown for what, three weeks now, we got one week to go and the first initial phase of this thing. And they went all the way. I mean, everything's closed, everyone's home. Business, uh, schools are down, businesses are down. Uh, when you walk the streets uh, with the dogs, getting a little exercise, everybody's going out of their way to pass within, you know, to not be within two meters of everyone else. We wave at each other, everyone's real friendly about it, but um, they took it really seriously. The messaging coming out of the daily meeting. By the way, if you want, at 1 p.m. New Zealand time, every day there's a meeting from the Ministry of Health where they give the latest numbers. Uh, go see Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, who is awesome. And it turns out there's a huge fan club that's forming here. And, um, and sometimes Jacinda's in there. They're really good. They're straightforward. They're give, they know their data. They, um, they speak to it really well. Jacinda speaks with a lot of compassion. Ashley speaks with a lot of competence. I should call him Dr. Bloomfield, I suppose, but I, I, I don't know. I've, I'm falling into it a little bit. I've joined the uh, Ashley Bloomfield fan club Twitter thing and it's getting funny here. <laughs> hey, anyway, the point is very competent, very good in a crisis, um, really good messaging. Um, and it's really interesting to watch. I, I, if anyone wants to know what the government here is like and how they take these sorts of things, I highly recommend you, you sit down and watch uh, any of these daily briefings. Yeah. Okay, another question. There is no more questions in, in the chat window at the moment. Uh, I, I completely agree with that. I go for a run and people get away from me and I get away from them. It, it's super interesting. Uh -huh. And that's been happening actually since before lockdown, which is also super cool to see. Um, I have a question here. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to say that uh, how I met Boyd, it was like, uh, um, I have to, so my role in EHF is uh, onboarding the fellows and making sure they apply for their visas and that everything it's all good for them to come to New Zealand and come to their welcome experience. I haven't been hearing from Boyd lately, so I was like, what's happening with this guy? Is he coming? What's going on? Is he coming to the welcome experience? And suddenly one day in the office, this guy comes up at the office in Wellington saying, hi, I'm Boyd. I'm one of the new fellows. I'm like, what are you doing here? I just moved to Wellington. I already have a house. My family's here. I'm just waiting for the furniture. So that was my first experience with Boyd. So you can imagine how um, that had an effect in my life because it's been amazing to meet him and hang out with his family as well. So, yeah. Okay, so. I, see, I see a couple of <laughs> questions here. I'll just yes. answer them. Uh, first, uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about Welcome Week. Um, this is the EHF specific thing. Welcome Week is really interesting. It's exhausting. Um, I knew it would be a week of talking to other fellows about their projects and their work. And I got to share a tent with an awesome guy named Edgardo Martinez. Hi, Edgardo. I see you typing in there. Um, but what you don't expect is that I'd say about half the time in the welcome week is getting to know the Maori culture and, and the Maori people. And that was really meaningful and moving. I don't know if you can hear kids yelling in the background, but they are. Um, there's a lot of depth there. And frankly, exploring that has been one of, the, one of the joys I've found of being here. And I say it to people and they hear it, but you don't really get it until you're actually here and spending real time with them. Now, there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of talent that is, um, that is kind of latent there. I see a question about tax laws. You know, my experience about uh, income from the US and New Zealand, you know, it, everything to do with US tax law is screwed up. I, I'm not kidding. Everything to do with the US and taxes is a pain in the butt. Um, I still have to file and pay US taxes on no matter where I live in the world. And that's not true for almost anyone else. So my experience there isn't really going to apply. Uh, thankfully, there's a US New Zealand tax treaty. Um, uh, which means that uh, money I pay here in New Zealand, I get to at least credit against my US taxes. And then as far as filing taxes and dealing with uh, New Zealand tax law, um, everything's simple, right? Like I was, I was talking to my parents this morning on a call and um, 
you know, I just filed uh, what several hundred pages of U.S. Uh, tax forms, and I've got a, a two-pager that I have to file here in New Zealand. It's, uh, yeah, everything to do with this sort of thing is just tremendously simple and straightforward, and easier to deal with here. Even but you can mainly do taxes. it online, right? Yeah, you can mainly do it online. So you know, I know there's countries in Europe where it's 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 easy. I'm looking for it. Well, let's see here. Uh, one, two, three. This, uh, this, this is the business taxes. This is it. Three pages. Three pages. Now, I'm still going to use EY and uh, Craig Riddle, who's awesome, to make sure I've, uh, I've done good tax planning for New Zealand. Um, I'm not going to completely guess it, but um, it's just not that complicated. Okay. There's another uh, question there, um, Boyd. Do you think post-lockdown economy calls for out-of-the-box ideas and innovation? Have oh, you thought well, of making any changes to your business with the changing global economy? Um, my particular business, no, just because of the nature of it. Um, I'm, I'm writing really deep tech software. I don't know if I really talk, I didn't really talk about it. I'm basically building an operating system here and its parameters don't really change based on the crisis. I know lots of people who are making changes. Um, we don't know what the post lockdown economy is going to look like. What I feel good about is that because New Zealand locked down hard and fast, I think it's going to be locked down for less time. So it will bounce back internally a little faster. But if you're an export focused business, then yeah, this is really a question about the global economy and how is it going to be affected? Um, how is it going to be affected by the crisis? And, and that's anybody's guess. Okay, now you're interested in what you do is not you should find new OS coders. You wanna uh, talk about your business? We have like five, a few minutes more. So we have some time. All right, so, uh, okay, here's the real brief. Here's a take on it. Um, I spent I spent 18 years at Microsoft, uh, 15 years on the Xbox team. I ran uh, the I ran the operating system team for Xbox One. I ran development for Xbox Live and the developer program for Xbox. And uh, you know you learn a couple things in those in those in that kind of a program. One, you realize that game consoles are really big, fat, hot, plugged in IoT devices, and they've got security issues like IoT devices, or rather, IoT devices have security issues like game consoles. And a lot of the lessons that we learned the hard way are absolutely applicable to IoT. So effectively what I'm doing is I'm building a new operating system. No, it's not Unix based. Um, I'm building it on top of a kernel called the secure L4 kernel, which is developed in Australia. And uh, go look it up. It's, it's very small. It's actually the most shipped kernel that no one's ever heard of because it lives in all these Qualcomm chips that are the radios and your iPhones and your Android devices. It's very secure. It's formally proven. Um, it's really hard to program to. So in a way, think of what I'm doing is I'm adding a layer above secure L4, uh, which brings back a lot of the services that you would expect in a larger kernel and makes it easy to code while maintaining the security, the security aspects of secure L4 and the speed. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. It's, it's actually pretty nerdy. That's great. Um, we have had a boy talking about Wellington and about his move in one of our um, orientation days that we organized for we and the city councils of different cities in New Zealand, organized for the fellows to get to know um, the cities and get to know New Zealand and, and the different ways each region can support their job or the, the, work, that they, the work that they are doing. Um, and it was really amazing to hear him. And I think just to finish, Boyd, I want to ask you your story about dairies and what you can tell us about, about the Kiwi slang and all of that, just briefly. Oh, Paula, uh, which story about <laughs> dairies? <laughs> I will leave it to you. you I'm sure you, you can choose the best one, but I just remember uh, briefly something that you said and, and where you find things and uh, about what the dairy in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, this. There's lots of things uh, that are just similar and yet different. I'll say coming to New Zealand is a lot like walking up a flight of stairs. 
You just know how to do it. It's familiar, except every once in a while, one of those stairs is too high or too low and you trip and you fall on your face, right? Uh, Darius is one of those. Like I'm talking to my friend Mahi and he's, he, we need a notebook or some paper or pencil or something. And so he said he was gonna go run down to the dairy and grab one. I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. And I saw an article in the New Zealand Herald uh, talking about uh, some guy held up a dairy with a knife. And I'm like imagining what, he's gonna point the knife at a cow and say, give me all your money or Bessie gets it, right? No, no, a dairy is a corner store. I, yes, they sell milk there, but they sell everything there, right? They've got paper and vegetables and wine and beer and baking supplies. Okay, so now everybody in the family, we're all calling it walking down to the dairy to get some toilet paper or whatever, right? So yeah, so dairy is one of those, one of those words that is a very Kiwi thing. And, and there's a bunch more, but you can never remember them on the fly like, like, like you want. Yes, thank you. I'll save the other dairy story for another time. Yeah, that sounds good. That, that I see sounds Leonard good. laughing there. Yeah, he knows what I mean. <laughs> oh, thank you so, so much, Bud. It's been amazing to have you, and it's amazing to... to oh, can I add one more thing? One yes, more dairy exactly. thing? Okay, this is, this is a, a legit surprise. Um, in Seattle, we had found a great brand of, uh, of yogurt that we fell in love with, like the couple years before we left. Really good Greek style yogurt. Finally, like the best yogurt I've ever had. And we legit had conversations about how that was one of the things we were gonna miss about Seattle. You land in New Zealand, we found the first Greek yogurt we, we tried. It was, a, it was called Puhoi, Puhoi natural Greek yogurt. One bite of that and I'm like, oh wow, the other stuff sucks. This is great. New Zealand has a very strong dairy industry and it's tuned differently than what I'm used to, right? They have actually bred the cows for low water content, high milk solids. And this is like milk that I have never had before. It's all the dairy products are fantastic. The yogurt's fantastic. It's, uh, it's actually really good. And that, I know it sounds like a pitch, but it was an, a legit surprise about coming here, right? did not expect to find the dairy industry that is here. And this is the other dairy industry, not the one that sells toilet paper. <laughs> yes, I, I agree with that. Okay, it's sorry. Beautiful, no, that's fine, it's all good. Thank you so much everybody for joining us. It's been amazing and having you here. And um, I just posted on the chat window, the New Frontiers website, so you can have a look. We have upcoming sessions um, coming up, many. Um, different ones and we want to hear from you if it's anything that you want to let us know that we should be looking at to hosting. Uh, tomorrow we have one with Randy Commissar which is a, a new fellow. Next week we have Emily and Eric talking about their how, how it was for the setting up a business and many more coming so uh, thank you so much for coming and just to, to finish uh, I will share my screen and show you the last things about EHF and New Frontiers. So thank you so much. Uh, applications for Cohort are open until the 1st of June. Uh, so it's the last opportunity to apply for EHF this year. So pay attention to that. Uh, and there is webinars coming up for, for you as well. Thank you so much and see you in the next session. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.